Thank you for having me and for, for, uh, for coming. And um, yes, so today I'll talk about a couple of works that I did in collaboration with Wen Mei Ho, who uh, also was a um, postdoctoral fellow here at Stanford for a couple of years and recently has uh, moved to uh, the National University of Singapore, where he's tied to the group. And I think that you will find many uh, things kind of echoing uh, Nick's talk from earlier because. Um, you know, the, the, the broadly the you know, background for this work is, is is related and it has to do with the advent of quantum simulator or quantum computers um, and in particular these uh, kind of architectures whether uh, you know, digital like something like in qubits and trapped ions or, or atoms <coughs> like ultra cold atoms in, in optical lattices uh, which are uh, being developed with you know partly with a with a goal of achieving um, quantum computation, so information processing tasks. But at the same time, in doing so, they are, um, you know, the, the cap capabilities you need to develop to achieve that, um, you know, can, can double as really powerful tools for exploring quantum matter in regimes that uh, would not be available in more traditional platforms. So in particular, the, you know, in order to do quantum computing, you need to have extremely sophisticated uh, local control on your device of system. And that can be used to drive quantum dynamics in, in regimes that would not be possible, perhaps, with some uh, typical uh, Hamiltonian uh, in a more traditional system. And at the same time, if your quantum computation is, is, you know, is going to give you any kind of result, you need to be able to, to read that, you need to be able to perform local measurement on other degrees of freedom, find out uh, the result. And this means that on all of these platforms, there you know, people are working very hard to uh, develop the capability of making local measurements of individual degrees of freedom with, with high accuracy. And this has the potential of letting you access uh, quantum dynamics in a much more detailed and much more refined way than what is commonly possible in condensed matter physics, where typically you have a few coarse-grained observables, like a few terminal uh, conductors or things of that nature, which try to capture the behavior of many, many degrees of freedom in a very uh, global and coarse grain way. So here instead we can do, uh, you know, this kind of this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, process. For example, on analog uh, quantum simulator based on triple atoms, you can uh, prepare a simple initial state, allowing it to evolve under its own Hamiltonian dynamics, and at a later time you can interrogate that state in a very uh, microscopically resolved way, and you can find out. Uh, uh, for example, the configuration of all the atoms, whether uh, any given site is empty or occupied, and you can use a snapshot of the dynamics in this way to learn uh, the kind of observables that you typically care about in condensed matter physics, such as local expectation values, uh, viewpoint functions, and, and things like that. However, in these kinds of snapshots, there is much more information. You have a whole uh, string of bits that contains um, correlations that go far beyond sequence functions that are typically of interest in many body physics. And to give you an extreme example of a place where that really uh, matters, crucially, um, the random circuit sampling that was uh, performed by, by the Google team in 2019 is an instance in which you have precisely this kind of setup where you prepare some, you know, you initialize some simple state, you evolve it under some complicated dynamics, and at some later time you measure out the state of all of the qubits, in this case on a superconducting processor. And then in this case, you want to compute some extremely complicated observable. So this uh, linear cross entropy uh, fidelity, which is meant to tell you, uh, you know, in this particular case, whether the uh, processor is behaving in the way that, that it should, and whether it's performing a task that is thought to be hard for classical simulators. 
So this, while it doesn't have some direct interpretation in terms of many body physics, it's some somewhat uh, contrived uh, you know, quantum information uh, problem that's meant to showcase the capabilities of, of, the, of the device. It's an instance in which you really care about the detailed statistics of all of these bits. If any one of them were off, you would get some, some garbage instead of the, the thing you want. So the, um, you know, this motivates, the capability of doing this motivates asking some kind of question uh, about, this, about these kinds of systems that, that would depend sensitively on all of these uh, all of these uh, local measurements and would go beyond the traditional probes that we have in, in mass matter physics. However, the question, of course, is, is there anything universal to be learned in this you know, vast amount of data? And to, uh, so zooming out a little bit, in all of these systems, whether they are analog or digital, um, you have some conceptually a setup that, look, that looks like this, so you can prepare some simple quantum state, evolve it, uh, and measure all of the degrees of freedom, and, in this way, transform your quantum state into some classical data set, okay? Um, however, it's interesting to um, point out that it doesn't have to be, um, you know, this measurement doesn't have to completely destroy the quantum state. You can, at least on many of these uh, platforms, measure only a part of your system and leave the rest uh, potentially untouched. And in doing so, you would transform your quantum state into some hybrid object that contains both classical data, the outcome of your measurements over here, and a post-measurement or post-collapse conditional quantum state that knows and cares about the, the outcome of your measurement on the remaining part of the system. Okay? Now, we don't have to even stop here. We could keep going with the dynamics, uh, continue evolving and measuring again, and we would be in the uh, setup that Nick talked about with monitor dynamics. And that we also heard about from uh, from Ehud Altman in the Q Farm seminar about a month ago. But um, for the purpose of today, I'm going to consider this set where we have some evolution. We uh, ask a question to part of the system, and then we uh, we want to understand the behavior of this composite object that's made of a residual quantum state and the classical data we get. And we and we we stop here. And we want to use this as a kind of diagnostic of the the dynamics that comes before. So a little more formally, the object that I'm going to uh, care about is uh, the so-called projected ensemble, which is precisely what I was uh, sketching earlier, where we have a given main body quantum state. We perform a measurement in uh, part of this uh, state. In particular, I'm going to think about uh, splitting it up into a small or finite subsystem A and a remaining uh, subsystem B, which can be much bigger or potentially infinite, and um, measuring out B and obtaining this kind of collection of, of B strings that come with a, with a uh, associated uh, border probability and a post-measurement quantum state on the subsystem A. Now, um, what is this uh, object? What is the ensemble? Well, one property that it has, which is, which is important, is that it's an unraveling of the density matrix. That is to say, if I uh, ignore the measurement outcome of my subsystem B, that's um, you know, outside of my control, and it's happening kind of uh, due to the coherence instead of a uh, kind of uh, intentional measurement, for instance, then what I would find is that uh, upon averaging over all of these possible outcomes, I would recover the reduced density matrix of system A for my initial many body uh, state. Okay. So um, this is, you know, one possible way of expanding out the density matrix, but it's Absolutely not the only one. This is a, a kind of many to one mapping of, of ensemble students' matrices. And this means that this, this object contains much more information than the uh, density matrix of my subsystem by itself. Okay. Um, the question, of course, is is there anything universal about this information? Does this object uh, achieve some kind of, of, of uh, behavior that, from a many body physics point of view, would be interesting? And the motivation for, for believing that this might be the case is that, in fact, the density matrix of my subsystem, as I evolve with some, some many body dynamics that couples to, to, to the remainder of the system, is, is you know, thought to achieve a universal form at late times, which is simply the thermal equilibrium density matrix. Uh, and because of the connection that we just pointed out between this ensemble and the density matrix, namely that. Uh, this ensemble represents one unraveling of rho, it's reasonable to think that there might be a universal form for the ensemble itself, 
at late times under dynamics, okay? It's important to point out that if this were true, if this bottom row holds, if, if the ensemble achieves this equilibrium form, it automatically implies by kind of uh, reversing this unraveling that uh, the density matrix itself should equilibrate. So this constraint would be uh, strictly stronger than thermalization, it would imply that the uh, local discrete from my subsystem reaches thermal equilibrium, but it would also be, um, it would be a stronger uh, constraint in the sense that the reverse doesn't need to hold. It may well be that the uh, density matrix equilibrates while the ensemble doesn't. Okay. So that's why we call this condition deep thermalization, just meant to be that, uh, you know, indication of the fact that this is a stronger condition. Okay. Very good. Um, so first of all, if this is meant to happen, what should we expect for this universal form of the ensemble at late times? Here, it's helpful to start from the simplest case, which is uh, the case of infinite temperature and uh, no conservation laws in the, in the system. That means that we don't have energy conservation, we don't have particle number conservation, uh, not of that structure. And in that case, it's reasonable to think that any two states in the Hilbert space should be equally likely, because uh, at least superficially, it doesn't seem that we have any reason to prefer one to the other. And so the natural guess one can make is that the equilibrium form of this ensemble should be the hard distribution. Let me say a few words about that. What is the hard distribution? It's the so-called unitarily invariant uh, measure on the Hilbert space. That means that if I take my uh, Hilbert space and apply any unitary rotation to it, I get the same distribution. So that is like saying that we have a rotationally symmetric distribution of probability, which is just a fancy way of saying that any two states are equally likely. There's no, there's no bias, okay? And from the point of view of quantum information, that is a very important concept that has many applications in uh, quantum information processing tasks. Um, it, it's often the case that by randomizing your state in this kind of uh, entirely invariant way, you can achieve some, some, some desired uh, tasks. So, it's, so it, this is in a way some high quality randomness. This is not some, some garbage that uh, that you obtain by sort of not being very careful with your, with your uh, quantum system, but this is a kind of randomness that has many uh, you know, beneficial properties. So um, before moving on, I want to say that if this is true, so if this ensemble indeed gives you the hard measure at late times, or for that matter, any kind of universal distribution, then this is a kind of remarkable fact about uh, quantum states produced by generic many body dynamics, because it would say that in a single many body wave function, which doesn't have to be random itself, it can be a completely fixed state, it can be a simple state evolved under some fixed Hamiltonian. Uh, upon you know, doing this prescription, upon measuring part of the system, you would obtain a universal random distribution of wave functions on the smaller subsystem. So this is a way of saying that inside this kind of fixed quantum state, there is a universal distribution hiding in, in some fashion, okay? So this is a, a fairly striking uh, property, if true. And um, on the other hand, the hard measure, you know, taken, taken literally is a very, very abstract concept because uh, it is extremely hard to produce. It's extremely expensive. Why is that? It's because the Hilbert space is a very big, it's a very big place. And most states in the Hilbert space are extremely complex. You will never prepare them in a finite time on a, you know, with a sensible uh, process. And so it's kind of a useful abstraction, but in practice, it's not so, not so right, what I would say. So what is much more uh, practically useful is the concept of quantum state K design, which is like a cheaper version of this hard measure. That's good for most intents and purposes, but it's much, much cheaper to prepare. So in particular, most of these kinds of randomized protocols don't really care for the complete, uh, you know, hard distribution, but they only care for some statistical moments of it. And so if we had uh, an ensemble whose first K statistical moments successfully match those of the hard distribution, we could use those instead. And that's what a, what a quantum state K design is, where K denotes how many statistical moments you're getting right by uh, taking, taking this ensemble. So um, to, get, to, to fix some ideas you know, more concretely, you can think of a single qubit where we would have, um, you know, here there's a few K designs for, for low K are illustrated. So a one design is, is given simply by these two states, equal for chance of up or down. 
And this will give you the correct mean for all your um, observables, but you will get all the uh, higher moments completely wrong. So, so in general, the, the uh, any orthonormal basis on the Hilbert space is a one design, but but um, it doesn't get any moments past the average uh, correct. For example, the variance will be wrong. So to get the variance right, we need to throw in more state. For example, these the vertices of the tetrahedron from a from a two design, and then the vertices of this octahedron from a from a three design. Which for those of you who are familiar, these are uh, so-called stabilizer states. Uh, which are very important also in quantum information theory. So as you can see, we can get more and more of these moments correct by throwing in more states into our distribution. And if we wanted to keep going and get the, the Haar measure itself, we would need something like a uniform covering of the entire Hilbert space, which as I was saying, is a very demanding thing to get. Um, and the general take home message here is that larger K requires a bigger ensemble, uh, meaning this kind of more uniform cover. okay? Great, so now, with all of this uh, kind of conceptual baggage, we can, we can get to the question of determinization in dynamics. So the setup I have in mind is initializing a simple initial state at the initial time, <clears throat> letting it evolve under some kind of dynamics, which would be Hamiltonian, or could be some uh, quantum circuits or, or whatever, whatever we have, and then forming a projective ensemble at different times and asking about the formation of quantum state K designs as, as time goes on. And um, as time goes on, we would have a, you know, in principle, a sequence of these time scales at which the K design condition is realized. And the first of them, this T1, um, corresponds to the formation, formation of a one design, which is itself equilibration of the density matrix or uh, thermalization as, you know, as we commonly know it. Uh, and so this is a familiar, familiar concept, a familiar time scale in dynamics. But after this time, in principle, we have a uh, whole sequence of these design times, which would occur later on. Okay? And um, we can label all of this collectively as determinization or, or uh, the, the asymptotic uh, T of infinity, meaning the formation of the, of the hard measures so of all the K designs uh, as determinization. The, 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 so the term is kind of new and is being applied a bit flexibly between these two users. So the main question is first of all, does this happen at all? So are these time scales finite? Do we, do we get these uh, sort of highly random distributions on the Hilbert space by doing this? And if so, what do the time scales tell us about dynamics? And uh, what can we use this uh, process for uh, from a practical point of view? So before diving into the theory, I just want to you know, pause here to flag a couple of applications that I can make this very practically useful and, and interesting. Uh, which again has to do with the use of this high quality randomness for uh, QI processing tasks. So in particular, all of these tasks as naively formulated require you to be able to go in and randomly rotate individual qubits <coughs> on your chip, okay, which, which can be, um, you know, in some cases it's possible, but uh, in, in analog simulators, it's typically not. You have some slightly more uh, coarse grained um, knobs, you can perhaps run a global field or, or something like that, but not these individual random rotations. So the possibility of, of you know, the existence of determinization would imply the possibility of doing this in analog simulators, but you don't have this high level of refined control, but you can still uh, bring in some ancillary qubits and let them evolve under a common Hamiltonian and then measure them, and in this way generate the randomness you need. So this has successfully been used for benchmarking a quantum simulator based on different atoms in this uh, paper by the Andres group at Caltech about a year ago. And then very recently, just last week, there have been uh, two papers on using this idea for uh, efficient learning of many body quantum states through the idea of, of classical shadows, which we also heard about in the Q from seminar by Robert Kwan a few, a few weeks ago. And again, the idea is to bring in some additional qubits, let them all evolve together, uh, measure the amount and, and generate this uh, random ensemble of states on the system of interest, which we can then use for, for this task. Okay, so um, this kind of motivates from a practical standpoint why we should care about this. And uh, for you know the next part of the talk, I'm going to go into some uh, exact results that we have about you know whether this happens and how long it takes. So the first class of models where we have any results about this happening in dynamics is so-called uh, dual unitary circuits. These are a particular class of quantum circuits, meaning 
we have, we imagine having an array of qubits here in, in one dimension. They are evolved by uh, sort of piecewise application of unitary evolution. So, so the pairs of neighboring qubits that, that are evolved by some Hamiltonian for some amount of time, and this is a group like A. Uh, and then this is repeated in a, in a staggered group of pattern to generate this global kind of evolution. And at the final time, uh, we produce some man body state and we want to uh, realize the projected ensemble on the state. And so to do that again, we, we measure all of these qubits in some basis and we ask about the post measurement state on the subsystem of interest. Okay. So dual unitary circuits are special in that they are unitary not only in the conventional time direction, as, as all uh, sort of closed system evolutions have to be in quantum mechanics. But they have this you know, very striking property of being unitary also in the space direction. So if I took this uh, picture just as a mathematical you know, diagram, I could unpack it in any direction. I could, I could view it as going upwards or as going left to right, or you know, there's no uh, particular difference. Of course, the physical difference is unitarity. So time direction is unitary, the space direction is typically not. But in this class of models, both are, and we can exploit this property to Yes. So what does it mean that something is unitary? Like what's the requirement for a gate to be unitary in the other direction if some partial transpose is? Uh, it, it's very, yeah, closely related to the unitarity of a partial transpose, we have swap, uh, and it ends up being, um, the, the entangling power has to be maximal. So like an I swap gate is um, dual unitary um, for, for qubits. For example, entangling power is maximal. Can you say some more words there? Correct? Yes. Uh, so uh, basically, unitarity means that the mutual information between the past and the future is maximal. You haven't lost anything. The same has to be true between the left and right sides of my gate. So the mutual information between these two legs and these two legs has to be maximal. Okay. So they're like as entangling as can be, and, uh, and they, they also have lots of other nice properties that have made them you know, great toy models for studying many properties of quantum field due to this. Um, great, so, so yeah, this is a slightly, uh, you know, this, this stretches your imagination a little bit to think of what it means to have a state that exists in time and is being evolved over space, but uh, you know, formally we can do it, and the property we <coughs> Uh, that allows us to, to you know, make analytical progress on this is that um, we can unpack this entire section of the, of the dynamics on, on subsystem B in terms of these transfer matrices, these kind of shaded uh, columns here, which are uh, unitary. And in particular, there's, there's a few of them that you can obtain as a function of what measurement outcomes you get on this subsystem. And any two measurement outcomes define some different unitary propagator, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Um, and all of them are unitary, okay? So as I try to unpack this diagram, I'm faced with basically a sequence of these unitaries, which are random and are determined by what measurement outcomes they got as I, uh, as I, as I measure my subsystem B. And as I keep going and iterating, I, I get a very deep product of, of, these, of these unitaries, okay? So this could be a very complicated problem in principle, but it turns out that if these four unitaries you know, if the set of unitaries I can get uh, are universal for quantum computing, meaning that they, um, they are sufficiently complex that by stacking them together, you can get anywhere you want in the upper space. So if that's the case, then a random deep product of these matrices will uniformly cover the Hilbert space. This is just a um, result about formation of, of, of state designs in deep unitary circuits that we can use here in this auxiliary dual <laughs> Um, and so from just as a consequence of this, we get a random distribution of states on this uh, section of, of the circuit. And then we would like to convert this randomness onto uh, our subsystem of interest over here. And uh, it turns out that that is, you know, that happens if and only if I have more qubits in this uh, temporal cut than I have in this spatial subsystem, which is the condition uh, from here, that the number of qubits in A be less than or equal to uh, the depth of my circuit. So this requirement comes out of just the kind of the, the, the geometry here, but it's a very physically reasonable uh, requirement because it means that the time that, that, that passes before it can uh, you know, achieve optimization has to be 
at least as long as the spatial size of the system, which is the time it takes to get conventional optimization. So the picture we get here is as follows. Basically, we have an initial state that evolves and at a time that's equal to the size of the subsystem, we achieve conventional optimization and also the optimization at the same exact time. We get not only the density matrix equilibrium, but the entire form of the ensemble to get to the uh, expected universal distribution. Okay. So this is a you know powerful result as a proof of principle that this happens in a concrete model. Question? So it looks from your circuit like uh, this actually pretty from the circuit on the previous page yeah. that uh, this actually pretty strongly restricts the necessary size of system subsystem B because if you've only got if you only need a steps in time then there's no information that can propagate from more than n over in, into system B. So uh, does this actually work for if you split your system just in half? Uh -huh. This is a very uh, good point, and you, it's very reasonable to expect that things that are further away than, than T wouldn't matter because they haven't had time to reach our subsystem. But actually, the measurements are doing a lot of work here. So quantum measurement is um, destroying causality. Once we know the outcome of the measurements, information can travel infinitely far away in space. So is, is this uh, limit on T still only true in the infinite B limit, or will it be true for some? Uh, so for thermalization P1, you need um, exactly uh, you know, the path needs to be at least as big as the system, but then you're fine. For these higher moments, you need, in fact, the path to be big. OK. Very good point, yeah. OK, so this is uh, nice as a proof of principle that this works, that indeed this distribution arises in concrete models of dynamics that are, you know, they look fairly exotic, but they're actually quite simple to realize. Something like a thick Dyson model, there's nothing, nothing much to it. However, the fact that all of these time scales collapse is uh, perhaps a bit, a bit disappointing. We were hoping to get a, a spectrum of time scales that would tell us something new about dynamics. And so it's, it's interesting to ask whether this behavior is generic or, or highly fine-tuned and special to this class of models. And so uh, to address that, we, we try to ask the same question of a more generic class of circuits now. So same kind of setup, but the uh, arrow of time now flows only vertically. So I have to put these little arrow pads in the gate to emphasize that unitarity runs from the bottom to the top and uh, not from the left to the right. So uh, this, this result we exploited doesn't, doesn't hold now. We have to find something different. So in particular, because of the fact that this transfer matrix that I'm shading here is not unitary anymore, lack of unitarity means that some information is forgotten. Essentially, unitarity is another way of stating that information about the past is completely preserved in the future. And it might be very hard to extract practically, but it's there in principle. You can just apply the inverse unitary and recover your initial state. In the absence of unitarity, you actually can lose information and you would like to understand how this happens as a function of, you know, of time and dynamics, but in this, in this case, of, as a function of, of distance from our subsystem. So to, to understand this problem, we make a connection to monitor dynamics, which is the topic that, that Nick was talking about earlier. We have a quantum circuit, which is frequently interrupted with, with measurements. And precisely because these measurements are breaking unitarity, they are making it possible for the system to forget information. So, in this kind of system, I may put in some message, I may encode some, some quantum state the input, and um, as a result of these measurements, which are reading out the information, my, my output state might not know anything about that information that I, that I put in. Um, that's essentially because of the no cloning theorem, where if, my, you know, if an eavesdropper is learning information about the initial state and is able to reconstruct it, then it can't be possible that the state is also inside the system. It has to have kind of completely left, right? Um, so, we want to understand this process of forgetting information in these monitor quantum systems. And to do that, there is a very elegant and very powerful mapping to a stuffnet problem that I'm going to just uh, flash because I think it's a very, it's a very uh, kind of beautiful framework that connects these exotic out of equilibrium entanglement phases to something very familiar like a magnet, a magnet ordering the thermodynamic state. So, the Thing we want to uh, compute is a mutual information between the input state here at the bottom and the output state here at the top. And 
this quantity maps onto the free energy of a magnet where input and output are oppositely polarized. We are forcing the input to be, for example, pointing down and the output to be pointing up in these kind of fictitious variables that are describing quantum information. And the mutual information between the two is given within this mapping by the free energy cost of uh, inserting the domain law. That, that is a consequence of having polarized these, these ends of the magnet in opposite ways. <clears throat> so the free energy, as we know from thermodynamics, comes with two terms. One is energetic and one is entropic. And the energy term comes from the uh, you know, energy cost of this domain law, which is some line tension times its length, which is, which is the size of the system uh, L. This term over here. The second term, the entropy, comes from the number of, of microstates of, of configurations where I could insert this domain wall between the input and the output. And you know, neglecting kind of fine structure of this of this uh, boundary, uh, I, I just have you know t places where I can put it. Uh, that is the temporal extent of my of my band, Okay, and so I get this this kind of uh, you know l minus log t mutual information, which becomes very small. So it's, you know. Information is forgotten at a time scale, which, which uh, you know, from solving this equation becomes uh, exponential in system size. Okay, that is the key result we want to take home from this, and just that uh, in this phase of the monitor dynamics, where the system orders in this uh, kind of um, volume law, volume law, or, or mixed phase, we have an exponential in system size memory time. Question. Sorry, I think I missed something. So this is what mutual information is this, and why is it related to free energy? Yeah, so this is, I'm thinking of a system that, that has a non-unitary evolution. So an example is this one that has unitary gates interrupted by measurement, but maybe it's non-unitary, and information can be forgotten in this case. And I want to quantify that by doing mutual information between the input state and the output state. So in practice, I could, for example, send in a registry of bell pairs in the input and keep them outside. And then I have a sort of final state over here, initial state over there, and I can compute up information between them. And that would tell me about whether the dynamics have forgotten information or not. Mm -hmm. okay. And why is it related to free energy? Well, this is a, a fairly technical mapping that I don't you know, have time to go into, but it's a very, uh, very elegant result. It comes from averaging over randomness. So you do need random gates. For this to go through, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, essentially the, the, very, the up and down variables of this magnet correspond to different ways of pairing uh, kind of replicas of the wave function okay. that you. arise in computing the energy. So, so yeah, that would be a whole talk unto itself, and it's you know it's uh, very interesting. Uh, by the way, this was uh, kind of pioneered by Yao Lee, who's a QFUN fellow now. So. Set of very interesting works, but I just wanted to flesh this picture as a kind of. So I find it very, very elegant and, and and interesting. But really, the only bit of information we need is this exponential in number of qubits memory time that arises in in these dynamics. Question. So is this across the entire circuit, or just across the non-unitary gate? Uh, this I'm now thinking of a global thing, so it's between the global input and the global output of the cluster. Okay, so now we just want to take this lesson from monitor dynamics and bring it back to our problem of uh, characterizing the projected ensemble in these uh, class of circuits. Okay? So again, to, to, to refresh your memory, we were thinking about how these temporal transfer matrices carry information over space from far away into our subsystem of interest. And the um, lesson that we want to apply has to do with the memory time of these dynamics and the number of qubits that, that are acted on by these transfer matrices is linear in, in time, so in the depth of the surface. So you can see here the number of lines that cross any, any vertical cut is something like you know, it's one per gate, basically. So, so it's proportional to the circuit depth. And that means that the associated memory uh, you know, length scale, in this case, is exponential in the number of qubits. Okay. And that gets back to the question that was asked earlier about whether I care about stuff that is very far away. This um, Length scale, if it were within a causal kind of evolution, it would have to be bounded by T because you can't have communicated further away than that. But as a result of these uh, measurements, whose outcome is known, I can actually uh, teleport information much, much further beyond what would be allowed by causality. Okay? So this is closely related with quantum teleportation. 
measurement based quantum computing and other interesting ideas. But anyway, for our purposes, the point is that as I go further and further away from my system, the memory of measurement outcomes gets progressively weaker and weaker. So, so this is why I'm shading this circuit, you know, that the memory of measurement outcomes fades away as you, as you go further. And this means that even though on paper you have this gigantic number of states, two to the number of qubits in the bath, most of them are in fact identical because if they differ by some outcome very far away, um, then the states will not be aware of it and will be in fact degenerate. Okay. So the fact that this poses a limitation on the number of states in our ensemble is a, is a big limitation to our ability of approximating the hard measure. And we want to use it to characterize uh, you know, the onset of optimization in two dynamics. Okay, so here there is a much more you know, technical and rigorous derivation that I'm gonna spare you. I'm just gonna give a hand wavy argument based on counting states very coarsely, okay? So the number of states we need is to get the hard measure is, is proportional to, um, you know, essentially you want to sample the Hilbert space very far. So any given state in Hilbert space has to be very, very close, you know, epsilon close to some state in our ensemble, okay? And uh, so how many such states do I need? Well, if you think about kind of sampling, uh, let's say you have, a, you have a line that's 10 centimeters long and you want to sample if you have an accuracy of one centimeter, that requires about 10 samples. If you take a square that's 10 by 10, it takes you 100 samples. If you take a cube, it takes 1,000 samples, and so on. So the number of these little uh, cubes you need is exponential in the dimension of the ambient space. And in this case, the Hilbert space has a huge dimension, which is exponential number of qubits, and we end up with this double exponential number of states that we need, which is really pretty big. On the contrary, the number of states that we have is, roughly speaking, two to the number of qubits that we care about. So again, qubits are within this length scale C that we have identified. And there's about two to the C of that. Each of them can be zero or one, okay? So now by comparing these two quantities, number of states I need versus number of states I have, I can find a, a bound on the time fixing dynamics to, to meet this condition. And uh, proceeding from here, we find that by uh, invoking this exponential scaling for the uh, sort of memory length, and plugging in this, you know, defining this scale as a beautification velocity, we get this bound here, where I'm calling this quantity a velocity simply because it appears in this kind of dimensional form as a, you know, multiplies a time and gives you a length. So, so that's why velocity, but it's simply a scale that emerges from, from this exponential um, scaling of the length. And finally, by putting it all together, we can uh, compare this to the conventional thermalization time, which is given by saturation of entanglement in dynamics. So I start from a disentangled state, it gets entangled with some velocity VE as time goes on, and when this entanglement is close to maximal, close to achieving uh, you know, one bit per qubit, then uh, my system has thermalized to infinite temperature, okay? So this is my T1. And this bound we show on T infinity, so the time taken to get the full hard distribution is uh, potentially gapped away from the regular thermalization time if this uh, new scale we define is uh, in fact uh, lower in entanglement velocity. Okay, so if that's the case, then we have a, we have a kind of a wedge between these lines and, and we can gap away deep thermalization from regular thermalization. Okay, so formally this, this is fine. However, it, it, it leaves you asking, you know, is it possible to, you know, first of all, what, what does it mean in practice? And is it possible that this ratio is such that the bound is actually interesting and non-trivial? And just to give you a flavor of when this is the case, we can uh, think of the uh, two ways in which we, we can understand uh, entanglement generation in, in dynamics. So there's, there's two kind of opposite paradigms that are very powerful and have been used uh, to understand entanglement generation. One of them is a minimal membrane picture, which is very reminiscent of the, the, the magnet that I showed you earlier, where there are Kind of different regions uh, whose entanglement you want to understand and you try to kind of bound them with a, with a, with a domain wall and ask about the, um, you know, what is the cheapest way of doing that, right? So that's, that's, that holds in kind of chaotic systems. But then there is a different picture which is based on quasi-particles. So that holds in quantum quenches where you also have some initial state and you abruptly change the Hamiltonian to something else. And um, in a set of, you know, for a particular set of, of uh, critical systems, you can, 
you can do this and you can understand the generation of entanglement following the quench from the fact that, uh, you know, as you quench, there is a abrupt generation of excitation from the initial state. And these excitations that are produced kind of everywhere, they then propagate ballistically, so with the uh, fixed velocity, left and right, but they preserve the entanglement that they have with each other. So as time goes on, uh, if you make a cut in your system, you will find that you have pairs of entangled particles that uh, straddle your boundary. And as time goes on, you get more and more of these pairs, and that gives you a linear entanglement in entanglement for a very different reason than what is given by the <coughs> minimal membrane. Uh, however, here we can ask about you know, what happens if I do the if I build the projector ensemble on this kind of state. If I go in and I measure uh, all the degrees of freedom in B, well then. Because the entanglement is stored in this kind of few body structure, I have a bunch of EPR pairs, and we know what happens if I measure one side of an EPR pair. I get uh, you know, a spooky action at a distance where my you know, partner particle instantly collapses in some fixed state that's determined by what I got on, on the other side. Okay? So if I measured all of the stuff in B, I would find a Pretty much a disentangled state in A, where I have all of these uh, leftover disentangled quasi particles that I that I uh, collapse by measuring the partners, and this is very much not a random state, very much not a half random state. Okay, so this is one case where you can achieve thermalization because entanglement can absolutely become maximal and you will get uh, you know a finite P one, but uh, T infinity could go to infinity. You could never get uh, thermalization in this case, for instance. And then by perturbing this picture with some weak perturbation, you might be able to reintroduce the deformization, but on a time scale that you could tune to be much longer, for instance. So it's possible to separate these out. And that's one instance of uh, you know, when our uh, when the bound that we showed uh, holds in a, in a non-trivial way. OK, so um, the, it's kind of intuition on, on, on what this, um, you know, what we are picking up with this uh, projected ensemble here is kind of illuminating because it tells us something about how much information we can learn from looking at our partial quantum state about the outcome of measurements on the other part. So in this scenario, as I collapse one part of my EPR pair, I can use the other to figure out what happened, right? In principle, like if my male state is up, up, and down, and I, and I find that my local state is up, then I can infer that the other side was, was measured to be up. Okay, so this um, point of view, it's, you know, it, it can be understood in terms of accessible information, which is a concept in, in um, quantum information theory having to do with, you know, how much, you know, if there are two agents, Alice and Bob, that will share this quantum state, and Bob measures his side and finds a certain set of outcomes, how much can Alice learn from her side of the quantum state if she's allowed to measure whatever she wants, you know, optimize her choice of measurements, can she infer, you know, how many bits can she learn about the outcome that, that was uh, obtained on, on Bob's side? And this is a problem that was studied in, you know, in the 90s. And uh, you can, you know, given, you know, as a constraint, the form of the reduced density matrix on your subsystem, you can ask what is the um, ensemble that maximizes or minimizes this accessible information. And it turns out that the uh, solution that was found for this problem was, was, was called the, the Scrooge ensemble because it's this. Um, Maximally stingy kind of set of states, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's a deformed version of the hardware. So you take your, uh, you take a set of states that are hard distributed, and you deform them a little bit by acting on them with square root of rho. So again, for the case of infinite temperature where rho should be the entity, then this does nothing. So we we have that in fact the hard measure is the infinite temperature scooch ensemble. But if we had a finite temperature ensemble with beta stones of you know, conserved energy or potentially other, other quantities, then this is a reasonable guess for what should happen in the case, which is that uh, I should have something that's very uniformly distributed, but with some bias towards, for example, low energy states, kind of a deformation of the hard measure in that way. Okay? And, and this has been put forth as an answer for the final temperature version of, of deformization, and then it was very problematic in, in that work. Um, and this point of view is also kind of illuminating because it tells us something about how uh, generic dynamics can optimally hide information from one side of the state and the other. Again, we, we kind of know fine tuning or, or, or anything like that. It is an interesting point of view, perhaps, on quantum chaos. But 
Anyway, with this in mind, I wanted to briefly, uh, in the last five minutes or so, present another recent work that we did where we were hoping to gain some analytical insight on the on a completely different setting where this might arise. So the first exact results that I talked about have to do with uh, you know, quantum circuits in one dimension where we often explore basically well unitary property that's, that's fine tuned uh, and so on. So we would like to gain some insight in a much less structured setting that hopefully could be uh, more general and tells us, tell us something about uh, generic types of quantum dynamics, okay? And a tool that has been often you know, deployed to understand the systems that are too complicated to handle exactly in statistical and you know, many body physics is a random matrix theory. So within quantum dynamics, for example, this has been successfully used to uh, understand you know, the spectral form factor, the level statistics of, of ergodic and non-ergodic uh, quantum systems. Uh, it's also about you know, the page curve and so on, all based on ideas from random matrix theory. So we were hoping to find a sort of RMT inspired model that could perhaps teach us some lessons about determinization in a similar way as these more operational ideas have been successfully applied to uh, determinization. And what we came up with is a uh, uh, minimally structured system where we have a bunch of, you know, degrees of freedom that are completely unspecified, aside from the fact that there is a subsystem of interest A that talks to a boundary that we want to call C. And then the boundary talks to some outside path B. That is all the structure we have. There's nothing else. Uh, and so the only constraint we're imposing is that the subsystem of interest cannot talk to the bath directly, but has to uh, sort of play a game of telephone that, that's mediated by this boundary C. Right? That's all that we are proposing here. And as a circuit model looks like this, we have uh, gates that again, completely unstructured, so, so sample from the hard distribution on, on, on unitaries that couple A to C and then uh, C to B, okay? And we're going to take the dimension of this bath to infinity in a way that has to replicate the thermodynamic limit that we uh, need to have for, for thermalization. Okay, so uh, just jumping to, to results, we find that as a function of time, so as a function of depth in this circuit model, we find that instantaneously the, uh, Projected ensemble realized by this system is the student ensemble for the relevant density matrix. So as time goes on, the density matrix approaches uh, thermal equilibrium, but it's gonna, it takes some time, has an exponential uh, asymptotic approach to, to, to equilibrium. And moment by moment, the projected ensemble is given by the student ensemble for, for that um, density matrix. Uh, so then uh, what we did is a, is a set of um, Sort of manipulations on, 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 uh, on this ensemble based on you know, exploiting random matrix theory to get the uh, analytical expression of the uh, all the cases and times shown here. And uh, it's probably not so illuminating as such, but the important thing to know is that uh, even as we take cases infinity, so we ask about the formation of the hard distribution, this expression remains finite. Okay, so we have that uh, deep, deep thermalization indeed happens, it happens in a finite time. And this time is somewhat distinct from the conventional thermalization. In particular, if you plug in on the factors and so on, you find that it takes about twice as long as it takes for uh, conventional thermalization. Yes? What was the importance or function of having the boundary explicitly separate from the path? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, oops, yeah, if you didn't have that, if you had just system and bath, and had a completely unstructured cut in between them. So you had only two kind of wires here with a harmonic bit between them. After the very first step, you get a global harmonic system and everything. I see. So and that's a is... bottleneck for like exactly. transferring or getting entangled between A and B. Yes. It serves as a bottleneck, mm -hmm. and by tuning the dimension of C relative to dimension A of A, you can basically modulate the entanglement velocity to make it uh -huh. faster or slower. Okay. So it's it's the minimal thing you can do to have a little little bit of locality, but uh -huh. not too much. So this could model like a system in any dimension, but could be, you know, 10 dimensional, doesn't matter. Like the neighborhood could be as big as you want, but it, but it has to be uh, finite. Yeah. yeah. Great, yeah. So 
So yeah, so we, we show that you get this, uh, you get the hard measure in finite time. This time is a bit longer than the regular duration time, so about twice as long. And this factor of two is a little bit, uh, we think, accidental of this particular model. And we think that in general, would happen in a kind of more structured model, we can solve what we can conjecture about, would be the following. So it, it would have to, you know, it would have to do with this recently discovered uh, two separate excision process in, in uh, random unitized circuits, which is basically the following statement. It's a statement that as you, know, you start from a disentangled state and let it evolve on under a random unitized circuit, the entanglement tension between two uh, subsystems initially grows linearly in time with some entanglement velocity. It gets pretty close to maximum. And that's when you conventionally say, okay, I'm thermalized, that's, that's my key point. But after that, it keeps getting closer to the maximum with an exponential approach. And this exponential approach is, is genetically controlled by a different entanglement, you know, different quantity that we might call a second entanglement velocity, a matter of notation. Uh, and in our model, these two numbers happen to be the same, but they don't have to be. And so what this is saying is that you have to first get pretty close to maximal entanglement, and that's your uh, conventional formalization. And then you have to get really close to maximal entanglement, like exponentially close, you know, within one over table space dimension of n bits of entanglement for uh, your system to achieve uh, determinization. And so this is a lesson we think might hold more generally, and that would be very interesting to try to uh, sort of probe in more uh, realistic or structured models. Okay, so with this, I'm going to uh, you know, wrap up. And um, what I've argued for is that you know, with this new level of microscopic access in uh, quantum simulators, it becomes possible to ask questions about quantum dynamics that would not have been motivated you know, in more uh, traditional settings. And there's a need to develop frameworks for you know, universality in this you know, new space where there's a lot more classical data to, to deal with. So one framework that does this is this idea of deep summarization, where we are using not just a reduced density matrix, but a whole ensemble labeled by uh, measurement outcomes. So these benefits, you know, snapshots of dynamics to understand universality in sort of late time uh, dynamics. Uh, I presented two works on this where we find some of the first exact results about this phenomenon. The first in connection to monitor dynamics in one plus one dimensional circuits, and the second in this kind of random matrix inspired uh, simple model of, of uh, dynamics. And you know, looking ahead, it will be very interesting to sort of sharpen connections between this idea and other uh, aspects of quantum dynamics that are that have been interesting you know, for, for a long time, like quantum chaos and scrambling and so on. It would also be interesting to add structure and you know, enrich this picture with symmetries, uh, you know, uh, interplay with integrability and so on and so forth, and see how the you know, whether this paradigm might give you more insight into that. Uh, and then, of course, on the more applied side, I've, I've already pointed out some recent applications of this idea to uh, doing randomized protocols in analog simulators, but there is, uh, you know, I believe there is room for more uh, developments along, um, you know, other possible randomized tasks that, that would be of interest with, with this kind of idea. Okay, with that, uh, Gonna conclude. Thank you all for your attention. I want in particular thank my uh, co-author Wenwei uh, on these two papers and also uh, Tibor and Pelika for collaborations on related uh, topics that were really uh, helpful in getting these ideas. And uh, yeah, we have to take any questions. Thank you. So we have a we have a question from Zoom. So the question is from Ami and on. Does the presence of C mm -hmm. slow down the normalization process? Yes. Uh, let me get. Yes. So the presence of C gives you a possibility of tuning. It's like a bottleneck that you can tune, and in the result here you can see it in in the detail. So there is a. Uh, one over VE here. So this entanglement velocity ends up being proportional to you know, or related to the Hilbert space dimension of C. 
So as you make C smaller, you can bottleneck the optimization more and more severely. And then it lets you play with this time scale and, and resolve this phenomenon better. Um, is there a connection between <coughs> this idea of accessible information and say the volume law or the very law phase? Mm -hmm. How can you maybe tell them apart? Aha, uh -huh. so you're thinking of monitor dynamics and uh, whether you can use accessible information to diagnose the phases? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's very interesting. I haven't really thought about that because in this framework, you're always thinking of a given many body state and then you measure at the end and you ask about correlations between the outcomes, but you could extend this to a kind of space-time picture where the measurements throughout are being used. And indeed, it might be interesting to ask whether, yes, you have two instructors that are dropping on different parts of the system. Can they access each other's information? That might be... I mean, that's subtle because it could be that they fail in both phases, but for different reasons. Uh, like in the area of phase, there's just no communication, and in the volume of phase, the information is too spread out and scrambled. But, but yeah, there might be signatures in that. Perhaps at criticality, it might be most visible. Interesting idea. Uh, thanks, great talk. So, I um, it was kind of confused by your slide on the K design mm -hmm. stuff where you have like uh, you have like a block sphere with some vectors there. Yep. Um, so, I, mean, I, I thought I understood a little bit about these things, but maybe I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so uh, like that K equals one, what yeah. that's representing is that you have an ensemble of zero and one and you're randomly drawing from that ensemble? Yes. So uh, my understanding was that that's already, uh, you know, if I unravel that, that's a perfectly mixed state and I have yes. no way of distinguishing between that and something that so 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 can you go a little bit more into that exactly no, that is an excellent point um indeed that is the one design condition the fact that the you know if you forget the unraveling and just look at the density matrix this is indeed the entity and that is the one design condition it's saying that the first moment of that ensemble has to be the entity uh, so in particular if you took for example the expectation value of z it would be you know plus one and minus one of these two and on average it's zero which is what you want and if you look at the variance of, of those expectation values, it would be, you can compute it, uh, but it would be not what it should be on the, on the hard measure. Or even easier, let's say the expectation value of sigma x, that would be zero in both of these guys. So it's zero on average, which is, which is great, but then it's also zero, like the variance is also zero, which is wrong. It should be one third or something like that. But if I have any, so any expectation value or higher order, you know, and any observable would be a trace of rho multiplied by that observable, right? Maybe you want to move the board in this right. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. So I'm just trying to think of what the experiment is. Yeah, what's the experiment that lets me distinguish between like k equals one and the k equals infinity? Yes. Yeah, so you have to correlate the classical data with the, the you know, with quantum expectation values. Uh, indeed, you are. Um, that's right. That if you take your expectation value of observable on any one of these states, and then average, you will define enough with just this, which will care only about the entity there, and you won't know whether it was a one design, two design, or anything else. Mm -hmm. What you need to look at is instead uh, first compute the expectation value condition on a given state. Meaning you take this object and then you look at statistical moments of this. So that would have to be an experiment in which you collect your uh, shots and put them in separate buckets for each uh, come back and for each instance of, for each different possible values. And you form a bunch of uh, so I, I have a box that's giving me a state. I'm trying to understand how do I, what's the experiment? Yeah, yeah. So the box, for, for you to tell this apart, the box has to also give you a classical, uh, you know, a set of classical bits, a tag that, that tells you. Oh, okay. okay. You so know. if I, I mean, in that case, I can just look at the tags and know 
if it's a k equals one or k equals two or <laughs> well you would have to uh, in, this is just going to tell you for instance um you know, imagine imagine this case right these are three designs the stabilizer states um so there are six possible states here and it tells you okay i uh, i'm going to give you state number six and then it's a quantum state and then i'm going to give you state number two and it's a different kind of state and you can make experiments on those right you don't know what the states are necessarily. So if it could be that it's a redundant ensemble where there's three states that are all the same, zero, and then three states that are all the same, one. So then if you correlate the classical data with the outcome of your experiment on the, on the, on the quantum states, you will be able to find out whether you have this scenario or this. Okay. You have to correlate the two. So it's some hybrid like classical quantum observable to look at. Otherwise, indeed, only the density matrix matters. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Yeah. So, so, so one way to describe like open system dynamics is use like this beam lab master tree. Yeah. So I wonder if there's any way to map that, which is kind of continuous in time, mm -hmm. um, into like a circuit model that has, for example, random memory at, at like random time, for example. Mm -hmm. Is there a systematic way to do this? Is there a systematic way to write a Lindblad equation for? Uh, yeah. I guess like home trajectory is like one picture. Um, but some, somehow that's still very different from like like random circuit model, which has like so many nice properties, I guess. Right, right, right. So, uh, so, so the main problem, I mean, there's no problem of principle in kind of proctorizing continuous time to discrete time, that's, that's fine. Uh, the main problem is that if you look at the Lindblad description, you are implicitly throwing out the classical outcomes of measurements. And those are exactly what you know, tags the different states in the ensemble and lets you, uh, <coughs> you know, Tell apart two density matrices that have a different associated uh, but, So, so. You but mean, I think in principle you can you can use like from trajectory to unravel like a mass decay, right? Yeah. In that case, you also have the memory results here. Uh, yes, but in that case, you are kind of you know it, it's like an auxiliary description where the quantum trajectories that need not be physical. They could be some mathematical abstraction where you're you're saying that you know there is some kind of noise, and I'm going to think of it as a uh, you know, perhaps a measurement with some with some outcome that I. Then I'm going to average over at the end, and I get the trajectories that I can simulate. Uh, but uh, here, the, the outcomes are, are, are physical, and they need to be taken into account. So um, the, yeah, the quantity for which you would want to write some sort of master equation would have to also have some classical data set that, that grows in time. So, so it, it seems a bit complicated, but there might be some way to do it. Thank you.